I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could the clerk please call the roll? Alderman Edward? Here. Alderman Simpson? Here. Alderman Turner? Here. Alderman Lesko? Here. Alderman Canman? Here. Alderman Job? Here. Alderman McMiniman? Here. Alderman Tylan? Here. Alderman Dove? Here. Mayor Houston? Here. The first item on the agenda is docket number 2014-058. Petitioner is the City of Springfield. The requested zoning and relief is to amend Chapter 155 of the Zoning Ordinance of the City of Springfield. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to approve medical cannabis cultivation centers and dispensaries in I-1 and I-2 zoning districts, and also medical cannabis dispensaries in S-3 zoning district. The Chair would like to request a motion be made to accept the Planning and Zoning recommendation and adopt the amendment of the code that is, was attached to the zoning recap for this docket. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded discussion. Uh, Yes, please. Mom Tyler? After discussions with Corporation Council, um, I, I will be voting for this, but I have to say it's with a very bad taste in my mouth. I'm not a fan of this. I'm not convinced of it. And But the alternative is, is that if I were to vote against this ordinance, it would allow these, these things to go anywhere. And that is not something that I think is acceptable. Thank you. Oh, McCammon. Question for either Zoning Council or Corporation Council. That this uh, zoning ordinance that was originally presented to the Council, it only allowed uh, the dispensaries in, in uh, areas zoned for industrial. But now, as I understand it, this has changed and it's allowing the dispensaries in S3, area zone for shopping S3. Is that correct? That's correct. But not S1 and 2. What's the difference between S1 and 2 and 3? Well, as a practical matter, because of the required setbacks under state law, the, the dispensaries have to be at least 1,000 feet from any daycare or school. And there simply isn't any place in the city of Springfield where, uh, other than the I-1, I-2, uh, those could be located except in S3. All right. And is all of downtown zoned S3? I do not know that. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it is all S3. There's a little historic, but 99% is S3. There's a little area that's not, you said? There's a little area that's in the historic district, like oh. Lincoln's Hall and the Governor's okay. Mansion. All right. Thank you. Further discussion? All members? I just want to follow up on Alderman Dylan. If you vote no, it allows it to go everywhere? Is that? There would be no restrictions. Okay. Further discussion? You know, further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Oh, that's right. We only got nine. Oh, excuse <laughs> me. <Yeah. laughs> I was waiting for that tenth vote. Uh, motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is docket number 2014-059 for property located at 3000 Stanton Avenue. The petitioner is the Islamic Society of Greater Springfield. The present zoning classification is a plan unit development with major use change in the plan unit development for a church, also an office building. The requested zoning relief is a variance of section 155.110. Size of parking spaces, 155.111 access to off-street parking facilities and 155.112 surfacing to be in compliance and to allow 10 years to pave and stripe the unpaved portion of the parking lot. Petition had a variance for the same docket number 2000 or 2001-008 and th that said area has been paved but the petitioner has expanded the parking area by approximately 30 spaces. The Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is denial of the 10 years but recommend approval for three years to pave and strike. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to accept the staff's recommendation for approval to allow three years to pave and strike the additional parking area. The Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move to accept the staff's recommendation to approve for approval to allow three years and add an additional two years giving them five years to pave and stripe the additional parking area. So you did? Additional two, so it'll be five. 
just a question to a corporation counsel. Should we just make it a pure five as opposed to? Uh, but uh, would that be clearer? I'm just. That's, I believe that would be cleaner. Okay. Would, could we okay, then. just have a motion then to make it a five year? Five years to pave and start the additional parking. Okay, sir. Second. Second. Then, then moved and seconded that we um, approve the uh, request for. Uh, five years to pave and stripe the additional parking area. Further discussion? Or is this a rock driveway? Is that what this is? Y yes, it is rock. Have we allowed this to be, have we done this before where we reach out this far? Sure. Have we? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. As long as everybody's getting the same treatment. Further discussion? Very no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Yes, he would. <laughs> Motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is docket number 2014-060 for property located in the 500 block of North 4th Street and the 4 to 500 block of North 5th Street. The petitioner's memorial health system. The present zoning classification is a B2 General Business Service District, section 155.034. The requested zoning relief reclassification to S3 Central Shopping District Section 155.032. The Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to approve the petition as submitted for reclassification to an S3 Central Shopping District Section 155.032. The chair will entertain a motion. Move to approve the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we uh, adopt the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, which is to recommendation, which is to approve the petition as submitted for reclassification to an S3 Central Shopping District, Section 155.032. Further discussion? There no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. But motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is docket number 2014-061 for property located at 201 East Madison and 326 North 2nd Street. The petitioner is Memorial Medical System. The present zoning classification is an S3 Central Shopping District, section 155.032. The requested zoning relief is a variance of section 155.111, access to off-street parking facilities. Petitioner plans to install parking stalls along the east side of the public alley that runs along westerly side of the north part of the subject real estate. Sp Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is approve the petition as submitted for a variance of section 155.111, access to off street parking facilities. Chair will entertain a motion. Move to accept the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we accept the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission, which is to approve the petition as submitted for a variance of Section 155.111, access to off-street parking facilities. Discussion? You no know, further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is docket number 2014-062 for property located at 2744 South 6th Street. The petitioner is Habitat for Humanity. The present zoning classification is a B1 Highway Business Service District, section 155.033, with a conditional permitted use to operate a large entertainment facility on the property. The requested zoning relief is reclassification to B2 General Business Service District, Section 155.034, and a variance of Section 155.001, definition lot to allow a second use on the lot. The Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to approve the petition as submitted for reclassification to a B2 General Business Service District, Section 155.034, in a variance of section 155.001, definition, lot to allow a second use on the lot for an existing billboard. 
The chair will entertain a motion. Uh, the chair, I'll uh, make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, recommendation of approval from the Springfield St. McKay Regional Planning Commission. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the recommendation of the Springfield St. McKay Regional Plan Commission which is to approve the petition as submitted for reclassification to the B2 General Business Service District, Section 155.034, and a variance of Section 155.001, definition lot to allow a second use on the lot for an existing billboard. Further discussion? There no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is docket number 2014-063 for property located at 1119 Woodland Avenue. The petitioner is Farmer State Bank and Trust Company as trustee under a land trust number 30-796-7 by Dennis Polk. The present zoning classification is an R1 single family residence district. The requested zoning relief is a variance of section 155.061 basic yard requirements to allow a three-foot side yard setback along the westerly property line instead of the five-foot required in a five-foot rear set rear yard setback instead of the required 20 feet petitioner desires to construct a pass-through addition which would connect the existing house and detached garage the Springfield St. County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is denial the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to accept the staff's recommendation to deny the petition. As a note, any vote to grant this variance requires a two-thirds affirmative vote of the Alderman or seven votes. The Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the petitioner and the objectors request this be continued to December 16. Second. 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 It's been moved and seconded to continue this until the December 16th That's correct, Mayor. Uh, zoning meeting. Further discussion? There no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. The motion passes 9-0. The next item on the zoning agenda is docket number 2014-065 for property located at 1632 West Washington. The petitioner is Vicki Beard. The present zoning classification is an R2 single family and duplex residence district. The requested zoning relief is a variance of section 155.061, basic yard requirements to allow a minimum side yard setback of two feet instead of three foot required, and a total, and a total for both side yards of four feet instead of the ten feet required. The petitioner desires to reconstruct unattached one car garage and attach said garage to an existing house for additional living space. The Springfield St. Louis County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to approve the petition as submitted for a variance of Section 155.061, Basic Yard Requirements. The Chair will entertain a motion. Move to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation. For a second? Second. It's been moved and second to accept the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission to approve the petition as submitted for a variance of Section 155.061, Basic Yard Requirements. Discussion? There no discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. The motion passes 9-0. The next item on the zoning agenda is docket number 2014-066 for property located west of South 2nd Street and north of Hazeldale Road. The petitioners is CTCC Properties, LLC. The present zoning classification is an R1 single family residence district, section 155.016. The requested zoning relief is a variance of section 155.068, garages or accessory buildings or structures, to allow as part of their proposed church development the construction of a cross with a maximum height of 150 feet instead of the 18 feet maximum height allowed. The Springfield St. County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to approve the petition as submitted for a variance of section 155.068, garages or accessory buildings or structures. The Chair will entertain a motion. Chair, I make a motion to move to, move to accept the recommendation of the Springfield St. County Regional Planning Commission. Second. It's been moved and second to accept the recommendation of the Springfield St. County Regional Planning 
Commission, which is to approve the petition as submitted for a variance of Section 155.068, garages or accessory buildings or structures. Discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 9-0. The next item on the zoning agenda is docket number 2014-067 for property located at 2305 South Park Street. The petitioners are Kimberly Higerson and Anthony Crofasi. The present zoning classification is an R1 single family residence district section 155.016. The requested zoning relief is a conditional permitted use pursuant to section 155 0.016C14, family daycare, home, type 2, conditional permitted use in an R1 single family residence district to continue to operate a licensed home daycare, type 2, at the residence with a maximum of care of 12 children with an assistant. The Springfield Salmon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is denial. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to accept the staff's recommendation to deny the petition. The Chair will entertain a motion. Chair uh, requests that this be continued to the April 21, 2015 meeting. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to continue this docket number 2014-067 until the April 21st uh, zoning meeting of 2015. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, what's happening here is the petitioner has placed her property up for sale and she has contracted for deed to purchase a, a, uh, a substitute property where she can uh, 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 conduct her home uh, child care business. And on that basis, the neighborhood is agreeable to this uh, five month uh, extension of time to uh, allow her to make this transition and there was a petition circulated in the neighborhood to um, agreeable to uh, this uh, five month continuance mayor further discussion there no further discussion all those in favor of the motion to uh, continue this to the april 21st 2015 uh, zoning meeting vote yes those opposed vote no voting is now open Motion to continue to the April 21st, 2015 is approved. The final item on the zoning agenda is docket number 2014-068 for property located at 901 and 925 South Spring Street and 930 South College. The petitioner is Insurance Partners Incorporated. The present zoning classification is an R5B, General Residence and Office District, Section 155.021. The requested zoning relief is a conditional permitted use pursuant to Section 155.021C1, conditional permitted uses in a R5A and B, general residence and office district, and Section 155.183, accessory off-street parking, not on the same parking lot as the use served, and a variance of Section 155.314 illuminated signs in 155.315 residential and office district sign conformance. The amended Springfield Salmon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval of the conditional permitted use to allow the accessory off street parking lot not on the same lot as the use served. Approval of a variance to allow 250 square feet of signs on parcel one and approval of a variance to allow a monument style sign within three feet of the front property line on parcel one. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is to accept the staff's amended recommendation for approval of a variance of section 155.314 illuminated signs and, one five, and of 155.315 residential and office district sign conformance to allow a 250 square foot of signs on parcel one and approval of a variance to allow a monument style sign within three foot of the front property line on parcel one. The chair will entertain a motion. Move to uh, approve the <coughs> move to pass the uh, uh, planning and zoning commission's recommendation. For a second, second. It's been moved and second that we accept the recommendation of the planning and zoning commission and accept the staff's amended recommendation for approval of a variance of section 155.314 illuminated signs and 155.315 residential and office district sign conformance to allow 250 square feet of signs on parcel one and approval of a variance to allow a monument style sign within three foot of the front property line on parcel one. The chair will entertain a motion. 
move, 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 move. move. Oh, oh, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> um, hearing all those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 9 0. Okay, the chair recognizes Treasurer Langfeld for presentation of a financial report. Thank you, Mayor. The corporate fund monthly cash report for the month of October, we had a beginning balance of $16,850,143. Receipts for the month totaled $8,491,785. Disbursements for the month of October totaled $16,091,456. So our ending cash balance in the corporate fund at the end of October totaled $9,250,472. Chair will entertain a motion to approve the financial report. No, so approval. moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion say aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. aye. The motion carries. The chair recognizes Chief Utility Engineer Eric Hobby, the Office of Public Utilities, for a brief presentation regarding CWLP. We can do it at the ordinance discussion. That's okay. fine. Okay, the chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first reading of ordinances into the record of this council meeting. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. All those opposed say nay. Aye. Aye. The motion carries. About two or three to <laughs> zero. <laughs> The chair will entertain a motion to dispense with reading of the minutes of the November 4th, 2014 City Council meeting and approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion. Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. aye. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre council reading of the consent agenda into the record of this council meeting. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion. Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. aye. Motion carries. The chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final pass. So moved. Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Mayor, yes. I had requested that item 2014-398 be uh, placed on the debate agenda, removed from the consent agenda, placed on the debate agenda. Okay. Is there anything else? If not, um, all those uh, in favor uh, vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 9-0. Okay, agenda numbers 2012 2012-123, 2013-174, 2013-376, 2013-397, 2014-085, and 2014-293 remain tabled or in committee. The next item on the agenda is number 2014-397, an ordinance approving the appointment of Timothy S. Griffin as City Council Coordinator. The chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2014-397 on final passage. So moved. Been moved and seconded. Discussion? There no discussion. Discussion, Mayor. Excuse me. Alderman McMenamin. I'm going to vote in favor of uh, Alderman Griffin on this. However, I think that We've gotten the um, cart in front of the horses on this one. I, I was listening to the, some of our state leaders after the last election, and for example, our, our next governor said, hey, let's not make any major policy decisions until the, uh, the new guys are seated. Uh, and he was referring to the, the election. So in this case, I think given that we're going to have at least five new aldermen next, next council, and possibly more. It really should have been to the next council to make this decision to replace a 23-year veteran that has been here as the council coordinator to let the next council make that decision. Um, I do agree that Alderman Griffin is qualified for this position, uh, but again, I think the next council should have made the decision, so that's, uh, my, my yes vote is with that reservation, and um, I think it was a close vote 
within the council to begin with uh, when we uh, when we made that decision to, to replace now instead of waiting until after the election. And um, I wish we'd, it had gone the other way. There were some very qualified candidates for the position, and um, I think the public thinks, well, maybe you know, was a stack, uh, was the de deck stacked, and uh, so we could have avoided all of that by waiting until after the the uh, automatic election. So, uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. Further discussion, Alderman oh, Edwards. Yeah, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm going to vote yes, and I'd just like to offer an alternate opinion of that that when I ran for office I said I'd do it for four years never once did I say that as my term began to wind down that I would stop voting on things and leave it to somebody else to do it because we're going to have some tough decisions coming forth to us and I'm not going to delay decisions and pass them on to somebody else my constituents elected me to four years not three and a half not 3.8 they elected me to four years and they expect me to do my job Further discussion? Further discussion. I mean, uh, the Alder, Norman Turner. Um, I just want to say that I'm excited about um, Tim Griffin, no longer Alderman Griffin, becoming the new council coordinator. I've had the unique opportunity to work with him um, as a member of the Sangamon County Board, and he was always very uh, accommodating, always took the time to study whatever issue that was going to be coming before us and uh, always made decisions based on the gathering of information. He was always very fair. And I think that those are all qualities that we would look to in a council coordinator. As a alderman who is about to finish her first term, I know the challenges that I had when I, uh, when I was new, and I really appreciated Joe Davis being here to guide me through and give me a uh, indoctrination or a, a, a quick, you know, how to. And I think that Tim, having the experience that he's had as a ward to alderman, will be in a very, very good position, probably the best position, in order to offer those same services to those new aldermen who will be coming in April. So I'm excited about Tim coming, and um, I wish him well in his new position. Alderman Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, let me say my vote will have nothing to do with Alderman Griffin. Um, I have found him to be a pleasant, um, an absolutely wonderful person. But I stand on my statement prior to this process that I believe that there are too many aldermen who are going to be leaving. Um, and the new aldermen ought to be able to vote on their own uh, council coordinator interview those individuals, ask questions of those individuals to determine um, if the person chosen would be right for them. So uh, again, my vote has nothing to do with Alderman Mr. Griffin as an individual. It's more the principal. Alderman Tyler. I would like to take the time to recognize the work done by the subcommittee. Alderman Job, Alderman Turner, Alderman Dove, Alderman Canman. You guys took a number of applicants that came in. I believe it was over 25, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And you guys got it down to the best six candidates in your committee's opinion. We spent two nights interviewing. Every, every applicant got the same opportunities. I think that we were more than transparent and fair in the process, and I think the subcommittee deserves a lot of the credit for that. And I know that every alderman on this council tries their hardest to do the right thing. And I think that the public needs to know that in this case, we did. We gave every effort, every ounce of energy that we could toward the process to make it as fair and transparent as possible. In my opinion, I felt a lot like Alderman Turner that the uniqueness of the position and the experience and knowledge that Tim Griffin brings in from having watched Joe Davis firsthand put him a little bit above the rest of the candidates. And it was just my opinion. I'm sure other people had their own, own grading and reason. But I do want to reassure the public that we did everything we could to make this open and honest. 
Alderman Amendment? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, uh, Alderman Griffin and I have had some uh, real honest conversations, and uh, this appointment uh, involves a position where they serve at the pleasure, and they, they're appointed by ordinance, and they can be removed by ordinance. So Alderman Griffin is taking a, a risk here that the next council will evaluate the situation differently, and I think each council should evaluate this position based on its own terms at the time that the council is seated. And I uh, hope that the next council will take a look at this and uh, make its own determination. This council can do what it wants, as Alderman Edwards has, has stated, but the next council can do what it wants to do as well. So um, I respect uh, Alderman Griffin for taking a gamble here. Um, um, that's part of the territory. Uh, the city council coordinator serves at the pleasure of the council, and uh, it's an exempt position, and that just goes with the territory. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Further discussion? Hearing no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 8-1. The uh, next item on the agenda is docket number 2014-398, an ordinance authorized the execution of a contract for fire protection services with the current fire protection district from December 1, 2014 through February 29, 2016. The chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2014-398 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded <coughs> for final passage. Discussion? Yes, Mayor. Uh, we, the research that was done uh, by Chief Fuston, we found that there was one uh, fire protection district, we found at least one fire protection, or protection district, uh, the Naperville Fire Protection District entered into a contract with the City of Aurora, which does provide for fire inspection services. It provides, however, that the, uh, the City of Aurora shall be permitted to enter into the premises within the district at any reasonable time of purpose, uh, and any reasonable time to make an inspection to determine whether or not the rules or regulations for fire prevention are being violated. So it, it just gives the city of Aurora the right to perform <coughs> inspections. It doesn't say they have to perform inspections. One of the problems that Chief Fuston had was that if we required the inspections, he's only got six inspectors and can ha hardly is able to inspect all the commercial properties in the, city, in the city already, and so how can we uh, take on more? So I think uh, if we would amend the uh, contract to say that just the city had the right to do inspections, not had to, uh, that that would make sense. And the city of Aurora, incidentally, I spoke to their deputy fire chief, Tom Greener, and he informed me that the inspections that they do in the fire protection district, in the Naperville fire protection district, are done by company uh, firefighters, not people from the uh, inspection bureau. And I was informed also that even in the Springfield fire department, some inspections, cursory inspections, are done by company firefighters, not by uh, the members of the inspection bureau. And I spoke with. Uh, President Dwight Emerson, president of the current fire protection district, is he here? He's, uh, if, if I could uh, add, just ask you something. If, now, we spoke uh, earlier today, and I think you had informed me that you, you, you would have no problem with adding a provision to the contract that uh, would give the city uh, of Springfield the right to uh, do inspections uh, for safety purposes. Uh, in uh, your in the current fire protection district, is that correct? We have no objection. We we want a contract with the city of Springfield, yes, sir. And uh, also, I think we discussed there were only the only commercial establishments in, in the current fire protection district are the concrete plant, the equine equine feeder business, the pizza supply business, the porta potty business, and brand fertilizer. Is that correct? Right. We so have only 10 or 12 businesses. Yes. Well, that, actually, that's five, what I just no. recited. So, right. Anyways, it's my understanding. It's a small number of businesses, yes, sir. Small number. So my point is that uh, I think, you know, what happens if somebody even sees something in one of these commercial establishments that uh, gives rise to uh, that there may be a fire hazard? Right now, under the proposed contract, our fire 
department wouldn't even have the right to go and inspect that business. So I think uh, President Emerson uh, said that he's concerned, though, about getting his contract that's before us tonight approved tonight because his current contract with the Village of Chatham is expiring at the beginning of December. Is that correct? December 1st, yes, sir. So, and I agree with that. So what I'm suggesting is that we, we pass this as it is now so they are not uh, without fire protection services. Uh, if, we, if we put it off, that would risk that they would be without fire protection services for some small period of time. And I think President Emerson said that he would be agreeable to amending to a, a, an amendment to this contract later on that would give the city uh, the right to, uh, to perform fire inspections. Act. Correct. That is correct. So my, my suggestion is that we pass this tonight, and then uh, try to negotiate. Or since the president, in good faith, said he's willing to accept that kind of a stipulation that's in the uh, uh, in the Aurora Naperville fire protection contract, that we uh, work on getting that added to the contract after we pass this. My suggestion is that we go ahead and we pass this, that as we talked about uh, when we dealt with this before, uh, we have a, a number of these contracts, and they really ought to remain the same for, for everyone. These are short contracts. This one is going to expire in 2016. Uh, Chief Fuston, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they all expire in 2016. So we will actually be starting to, to do the renegotiation on those that can be an item that we can do with with all of them and I think that would be the, the way to, to do it rather than deal with amendments or, any, or have one that is is different than the other the chief can then have the opportunity to figure out exactly you know how we would approach this what the cost would be etc well, I think yeah I think further, it's further discussion or, you know further discussion fair, as I said I think it's you know it's great it's crazy for us not to have the right to even inspect these uh, businesses that where our firefighters are going in there risking their lives and their safety and uh, if we could prevent a fire or, pre or prevent a a hazard that would uh, cause a fire or make a fire worse even if we can only do it in this fire protection district we ought to do it for the discussion for no discussion all those in favor of the motion vote yes those opposed vote no voting is now open Motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is 2014-399, an ordinance authorized execution of a contract with Gold Global Emergency Products Incorporated for the purchase of one Pierce Air Aero Dash XT pumper in an amount not to exceed six hundred seven thousand six hundred fifty nine dollars for the Springfield Fire Department. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number twenty fourteen dash three nine nine on final passage. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded for passage discussion. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes nine zero. The next item on the agenda is number 2014-403, an ordinance approving a professional services agreement with Burns and McDonald Engineering Company Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $2,161,300 for professional engineering services for the Dolman Natural Gas Startup Project for the Office of Public Utilities. The chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2014-403 on final passage. Motion to approve. Second. Been moved and seconded for approval. Director Hobby, would you? Thank you, Mayor. Last week I was asked if we kind of give some background on 3132, the cost of operations. So hopefully this will give you some idea of those costs. And actually we'll spread out our handout here, the paper copies. And then also we were asked a little background on Burns and Mac, and there's some there's a data sheet in there too that talks about the background of Burns and Mac. And it was kind of going on memory, but yes, they were the engineering firm that designed our first our lake back in the 1920s. So they have a little bit of history. Tracy. As 
So I think everybody pretty much has a paper copy. So, you know, again, this is talking about the operation of Dalman 3132, because uh, those are the ones being discussed. So, you know, the agenda, we're going to talk about the financial operation of the units. You know, we've been talking about there, there is a closure cost. It's not free to shut them down. You know, we're talking about the natural gas upgrade, and it has some cost, and then turbine overhauls that happen over the, you know, the future years. They want to talk about some power price, basically market scenarios. Um, closing units also has an impact to our customer cost. It also has an impact to the corporate funds. So we want to make sure we talk about that. We'll have some summary and what our conclusion is. So, you know, talking about the financial analysis of operation of 3132, you go to the uh, first table there. Basically, there's two re primary revenue sources on the wholesale side. That's what we sell energy to the market. And then we also sell capacity to outside uh, CWLP. And that, you know, as expected with where prices are today, will generate a little over $14 million in revenue. And then you look at the operating expenses. The biggest one is fuel. Uh, there's variable O&M for operating the plant. There's direct labor cost uh, related to operation of those units. And there's direct maintenance cost. And that's you know, a little over $13 million. <laughs> or on an annual basis, it'll generate a net revenue of about $430,000. That's in low market conditions. It doesn't make a lot of money, but it does make money for C CWLP. <coughs> you know, the next slide is we're going to talk about the closure costs. And that's what we've been talking about here a lot lately. You know, if you look at that table, closing of the units has immediate costs. And what I mean by that is, as we talked about before, they're the only generating units on our 69 kV system. That's where two thirds of our load sets at. Now we have a 138 loop that goes around the city, and that was built with Dalman 3 in 1980. And our interconnections are there, and Dalman 4 is on that. Originally, all the lakeside plants were on the 69 kV system. The first two Dalmans were on the 69 kV system, and so was all of our load. When we retired the lakesides, and now if we retire one and two, Basically, that 69 kV system is sitting there with no generation. So we have to install more transformers to step the voltage down to that. Otherwise, we're running the risk of blacking out two-thirds of the city during summer load conditions. And so that's where this comes from. And we had some discussion last week. This was part of the Burns and Max study. We did a study in 2012 that looked at all the alternatives. The 8 million, 8.9 million here, and that's it was about 8.6 in 2002, so this is a little bit adjusted for inflation. Other alternatives were 12, 15, 16, 18 million. This is the lowest cost alternative our staff found where we can still meet the reliability criteria. <coughs> also, as we talked about, there's, there's no building heat in the building. The building heat is we have three great big boilers, Dalman 1, 2, and 3. There's always one running. If we close 1 and 2, well, Dalman 3 was on outage this spring, as we talked about a lot. It was at an outage in March. Without building heat in that place in March, that place will freeze, and we would ruin 33. So you have to install building heat through the entire building. You know, it's, it's an estimate between a million, two million dollars. We don't have detailed designs on it, but so I put it in at a million and a half dollars. We haven't got quotes. We haven't had anybody go out there because it's going to be very expensive to overlay building heat in the entire place. There's also closing costs. We've got hydrogen, uh, oil, other miscellaneous costs if you have to close it. So um, closure has an immediate cost of around $11.4 million versus $430,000 in revenue. So that's what we talk about. When we talk about it's more expensive to close it, it costs money to close it, and you lose revenue. The next part is what we're talking about here tonight, the natural gas startup. And, and also went and talked about some other costs. You know, natural gas startup, as we talked about, including some of the engineering, is around $4 million. That's the part associated with 3132. Over the next five to eight years, we would do turbine overhauls on those units, too, 3132. And those will be a little over $3 million. But those occur over five to eight years. And the natural gas startup, is, startup conversion is one time. And that gets us compliant with the current, all the current past EPA regs. It puts us in a much better position for, for future compliance, too. And the key point here is the 2.2 million occurs over the next five to eight years while we're gaining revenue. 
the 11.4 will be have to be spent before we can close the plant. That's immediate. So again, five day years worth of operating expenses is still greater than the immediate closure costs. The next part is talking about market scenarios. And with what we've done is take a look at, you know, uh, forward energy price for selling. And this is kind of looking out to the future for 2016. And we used 43.50 because that's where power prices are going. We'll have a little bit about that. And selling 265,000 megawatt hours, that's where we generate $430,000. Just for example, I put five years on there. That would produce about $2.1 million over five years if the market is increased by 10%. Over five years, you could generate almost $11.5 million. If they increase by 25%, you could generate over $27 million to CWLP. You know, a 40% increase is $46 million. Well, there's a lot of people who maybe say, well, you know, those are very optimistic. Those are high assumptions. We believe these are reasonable and conservative. If you look at what we just sold last week in, at the Illinois Hub for January and February, we sold it at $53. That's nearly the 25% increase price. Also, our last five-year average of sales has been 275,000 megawatt hours off of Dalman 3132. Our base case uses 265. We're not inflating it, we're not running it up, we're using numbers that are there. They've, we've had a lot higher numbers than that, yes. Uh, Director, I believe, uh, just to kind of explain to some of the people who are watching at home, the reason why the uh, amount of profit on each of these goes up so dramatically with each percentage increase is because your cost outlay was already absorbed in the initial. So everything, it's the minimum, it's a minimal cost on the additional power generation as you go higher and higher with the percentage. Yeah. Which is why your income grows greater and greater. Correct. Your, your cost of fuel stays the same. So you, as the price goes up, your margin gets greater. So your net revenue just grows immediately. So that's why, price. just to explain to people why it jumps from yeah. 2 million to 11 million to 27 to 46, just so they know that you're not you know, playing with the numbers. Yep. It's definitely because of the fact that we have a sunk cost that's already been absorbed, and now we're moving forward with a possible. Yes, the, well, the, the key part there is, you know, the cost for that megawatt hour doesn't change because the price of the market went up. So our fuel cost to create it doesn't change, but the revenue we're getting is going up. Right. So the, that number grows. The profit margin is greater. Yeah, higher. your net revenue grows significantly. The other part, if you look at that table on the right, Date, we get this, it's called the TEA Daily Energy Commentary. That is the Energy Authority. We've seen a lot of ordinances up here. That's our partner we use. They're owned and operated by municipals. Um, they do all of our marketing of power. They do all of our forward analysis of you know, risk modeling. This shows the PJM West at the top. That's basically Chicago prices. And it shows you what I was trading for last week. Those prices, and if you look at your sheet, they're, they're averaging nearly $60 a megawatt hour in the Chicago area. If you look at the prices for December, January, February, March, April, they're averaging nearly $50 a megawatt hour. That's real trading going on in the market. That's nobody's speculation. This is what power was trading for that day when people were doing forward sales. This is real information out there. So when you look at these prices and say, nah, they're, they're too high, they're too optimistic, you look at where they're really going, they're, they're in line. You look at the PJM West one at the top, this is why Dynagy has made some noise recently. They want to move to the PJM market because that's what that PJM West is. Val the value of energy and capacity is a lot higher. They want to move the entire state of Illinois into the PJM market and out of MISO. The Indiana hub represents the closest trading location to the MISO Illinois price that we have. So that's the most representative. Talking about supply is going to decrease. It's not increasing. There's MISO's predicting capacity shortfalls. You know, on simple supply and demand. When supply goes down, prices don't go down. And so where does that come from? Well, this next slide 
This is from a MISO presentation that they did to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that they did in September. And it has the Addison resource forecast. The, I think the key part here is if you look at that top right corner, they're saying in 2016, without the emergency operating procedures, they expect to have a loss of load, basically blackouts, due to the inability of generation to meet enough capacity. Not weather, not trees. This is, we won't have enough generation on the system. Historically, if you look over to the left where we've operated, instead of three days a year, it's less than one in 10,000 days where we would have a blackout due to a loss of generation. We're going to go from a 20 to 30% reserve margin to a 4.5% reserve margin. Basically, use 10% of your generation due to severe weather or mechanical problems. We don't have enough to meet our load. So that is a big risk as we look forward as, as these plants retire. This next one we've seen a lot. Historical power prices been well north of 50 before the Great Recession. And at that time, we had a lot more length and capacity. That's when we were operating in 20% reserve margins. So the other part is the additional value of 3132, pilot and fuel adjustment. The top part there is corporate fund. Wholesale pilot revenue. This is the same scenarios we use, the base creates $430,000 in net revenue. 30% of that net revenue goes to the corporate fund in the form of the pilot. You run those scenarios out, that's an annual value that would be provided front through the wholesale off of 3132 to the corporate fund. This is why back earlier the Blue Ribbon Report recommended this change because this was the opportunity to fund police and fire pensions was from this revenue source. Without it, there's no this, this number goes away. Customers, Dalman 3132 supply on average about 155,000 megawatt hours to our customers. It's been as high as 300,000. It runs during the highest load, highest price times. And during those times, it can make electricity cheaper anywhere from 50 to 30 to $40 a megawatt hour cheaper than what we can buy it from the market. What this would amount to is a higher bill on every customer due through the fuel adjustment. It's an indirect rate increase if you close the plants. They will pay more through fuel adjustment on every bill because of the purchase power. And we're estimating that could be a million and a half to $5 million annually to our customers through fuel adjustment. It's not a rate increase that we pass through here. It's a fuel adjustment. It's an impact of higher purchase power costs because we supply our customers during the highest load times last winter and during peak summers when prices are very expensive. That's when these units have great value to our customers. So kind of the summary, the variables, uncertain information, no one can predict these with uncertainty. Any forecast on the market prices, what I can tell you is they're gonna change. They're gonna go on day to day. We can't get people to quote us firm power prices for five and 10 years because there's so much uncertainty, so much risk out there. What I know is there's a lot of pressures to drive up prices. There's gonna be a lot of plants closing. The more we depend on natural gas, the more that tends to drive up prices. Our gas turbine it, right now to run it with fuel prices is around $60 a megawatt hour, which is higher you know, than any of our coal units. And capacity prices will go up at the same time when you close plants. EPA regs, there's a lot of proposed ones out there, and they're being discussed. What we know is from the proposals to the final rules, they go through many, many changes. They go through many, many legal obstacles. Um, they're going to change. I can't speculate on what they're going to be. No one can tell you with certainty what the final rule is going to be and how it impacts us, whether we'll be fine, whether we've got to do a, a major investment to comply, minor investment, or nothing at all. It's a guess. So what that goes to is what do we know? We know Dalman 3132 produced positive revenue for the city and CWLP. There's opportunities if market prices go up for significant revenue for the city and CWLP. 
the people know right now, CWP Electric's not in the best financial position. So the extra revenue would be very favorable to us. Dalman 3132, lower our cost to our consumers. They protect our consumers from very mol uh, volatile market conditions in summer, cold winter uh, situations. And closure has immediate costs, 11.4 million. I'm not sure how we would fund that. You know, we're not setting on 11.4 million in cash. We don't have that ability. Once you close the units, you're talking about 20 plus layoffs. And there's no way to reopen them if the markets become favorable. That also is a loss of about $13 million of annual expenditures. A lot of that goes through the local economy, local vendors, on top of those 20 jobs. What we do know also, if we do the natural gas upgrade now, we meet all the current regs. We meet all of them. Director? Yes. One thing which I'm not seeing estimated on here, I know you referred to it earlier in the presentation, was that the cost to our, our citizens would go up with the loss of Dalman 31 and 32. Do you have an idea of how much per month or per year that may increase a person, an average person's bill by if we were to close these? Um, Ballpark. Yeah, at five million, I, let, let me give that a little bit of thought here. I don't have that off the back of back. But I mean, it's, it's not something that would just be a minor addition of like a $10 fuel adjustment per month. It would be something a it would have bit. impacts, and you know, the, the more you energy use, like the businesses, it would be the most detrimental to businesses. And if the businesses' larger. costs go up, they'll pass the cost on to their consumers. Yep. Or figure out somewhere to go that's cheaper. <clears throat> so, the conclusion, you know, my recommendation is you make decisions based on known information, not speculation. We know what it does. It produces revenue. It reduces cost to our consumers, and we can meet all the known regs. Closure costs more than the upgrades. Closure will have an exp a cost of lost revenue and closure cost to CWP. It's a loss of pilot fund and it's an increased bill cost to our, cons our customers. So you come down to the thing, the final conclusion is upgrade of the units is our best option at this point with what we have available. Questions? So that's uh, Mr. Harvey, in that the uh, under the ordinance that we have before us is to spend 2.16 million for engineering costs, and in that Burns and McDonald report in Table 8-3, it said that it, that estimated the engineering for natural gas startup would be. Uh, let's see, in in Table 8-3. Recommend it, it, it estimated uh, engineering costs to be 525000 So I'm just wondering how, if you can explain that the difference in those two figures, why it they're, they're, you know, they're all estimates, plus this includes engineering support, construction support. When we hire people, we hire them to support us beyond there. Um, you know, I don't have the exact stuff in front of me, but. Typically, when we hire people, we hire them to support us through the entire process and review. Well, it was t in, in this the engineering firm that would be doing this engineering under this ordinance. If we pass it, is Burns and McDonald, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I'm trying to figure. Out, they estimated in in that study they did for us. Uh, I would have to look at those numbers, and I would have to ask them exactly what they did. You know, at that time, it was just an estimate, a round number. Now we've looked at what it's going to take. You know, we've asked them for a detailed proposal um, and, that, and asked for the other part. This is that table if you want to look at it. And I understand it's just one number. I'd have to go back and ask them what all they put into it, you know, what it goes into. For the discussion? For the discussion, Mayor. Thank you, Director Hobby. As I understand, understand your presentation, you're, you're telling us to keep our options open, keep 31 and 32 viable, and, and so forth. The ordinance we have before us is to spend two, uh, upper, uh, beyond $2 million 
before Burns and McDonald. That's what's before us. And this is basically a down payment on a larger spending that would take place down the road. And with regard to Burns and McDonald, they, they wrote this massive report that we got a year ago. And, and this report at 11.5 in the economic evaluation, it states, quote, based on the economic evaluation developed for this report, Dahlman Unit 31 and 32 are economically marginal units under current market conditions. So we've got the engineers we're about to hire that are telling us that when they did the report a year ago, units 31 and 32 were economically marginal. Now, I agree that we've got to keep our options open. We don't know exactly what's going to happen down the road. Uh, what, what I'd like to propose to the council, and I hope the council supports this, is because uh, we shouldn't be afraid of, of an updated evaluation. If, if, if these engineers say that things are, you know, let's invest more in the plants, let's take that into consideration. But I'd like to offer a, um, a floor amendment that basically says it would be new section 3.1. City Water Light and Power shall obtain an updated economic evaluation from Burns and McDonald regarding Section 11.5 of its December 2013 study. And City Water Light and Power shall also retain an outside independent consultant to com comment on the updated economic evaluation. So basically, I'm saying let's go forward with this ordinance, but let's keep getting updated information as we go along. And I think the public will appreciate hearing it from outside experts, and so should, should we on the council, uh, so we have a basis for our decision making. So I, I hope there'll be a, a second for this um, motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? There. All members? Yeah, I, I think we're adding more cost here. I mean, I'm not sure, but I'd sure like to have a cost of what a secondary analysis is going to cost us. And, and listening to your report, we've all sat here and we've all listened to current market conditions. And we've, we've all watched the news, we've all tried to pay attention to market values. And as plant closures go down, market revenue is going to climb. I mean, that's just kind of how it works. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. And there's been a war on coal coal-fired plants and the other communities have not spent the investment that we've spent and a lot of money to stay ahead of the curve so that these options are available to us. If we hadn't and our community hadn't had, had told us, they like that plant out there. They like having the security. We grumble a lot of times about what CWLSP doing. We all look at our bill and we, we don't like it. But we have consciously made an effort as a community, as a council, as the administration to invest in CWLP for a reason. Because when that light switch is flipped, we like it to come on. We don't want to have to depend on somebody else and go through what California goes through with the rolling blackouts and New York City goes through with the rolling blackouts. This protects us from that. And the citizens of this community are pretty proud of their power plant. Now, we've had our ups and downs and we've had our fights in the city council about the way things should go. But we also like ownership. And while I'm sitting here, We've spent money to upgrade that plant over and over and over. And it just disheartens me that we sit here and make these guys prove the point over and over and over to the point of sometimes they want to throw their hands up and walk away from us and we don't treat them like the professionals that they are. And granted, you're looking at a guy here that pushes the envelope once in a while, and I'm sure Eric gets mad at me a lot, but they always come back with an answer to the question. It may not be what I wanted to hear. It may not be what somebody else wanted to hear. 
but they bring the answer back. And if we're smart enough to keep digging and keep questioning, I mean, I don't just take for granted what they say. I go out and read, and I try to re call friends that I know they're in the electric business. There's no doubt in my mind from what I've studied, what I've read, what people have told me, that with the closure of plants and what, without the development of new plants coming online, there's going to be a problem down the road. And it comes to the consumer's pocketbook. And I'm here to protect them. And in essence, I'm here to protect CWLP to make sure that our constituents are taken care of. So I'm going to vote for this thing, and I'm going to vote for it until the marketplace tells us that we can't vote for it or until the regulations run us out of, it, out of business. And it's not a question of us questioning the power plant, the staff, the personnel. That's what we do. That's our job. But we have people come into this chambers because they think we're ashamed of our power plant, that they're not doing the job for us. Well, I'm not ashamed of them. I'm pretty proud of them. And I'm proud of the job they do. And that plant meets and exceeds all standards because the citizens of this community have demanded us to do that. And now to throw those investments away would be a shame. So I hope my fellow council members will vote for this ordinance and keep moving forward. Further discussion? Alderman Tyler? I agree with everything Alderman Edwards said. And the other point that I'd like to make is, is that when a financial report calls something marginally uh, profitable, that's still a positive. It's still a, ver a very positive thing. Break even is usually the point where they start considering whether or not to tear something down. If it's costing you as much to do the job as what it's costing you to produce, then that's where you start wondering why you're in business. Nobody is going to be in business very long if all they're making is what it's costing them. A marginally profitable power plant being supplemented by Dolman 33 and Dolman 4 protects our investment. As the director said, we have an issue with the uh, KV ratings. That 69 KV rating would cost us a bundle to deal with. I think the, the best way right here is exactly the direction that the previous city councils have set. There's been a number of votes made to invest money into these plants. Lakeside's already been shut down. Those needed to go, and they went at the proper time. I trust the director to come to us and tell us when it's going to be the proper time to take retire Dalman 31 and 32. I don't expect those plants to be operational much into the 20s based on just conversations that we've had. But for the next 10 years, they can still be marginally or exceptionally profitable based on the market. But I expect that they will always make a profit. I think that's a key point. I've said here before, and I'll say it again, the day they cost us money, we will recommend closing them. If you look at during budget time and other presentations we've done, in the last five years, we're down 140 people. You know, a lot of people talk about, this is about jobs. We've eliminated jobs. This isn't about jobs. This is about what do we do for our consumers long term. Because our job is, we're not a coal company. I'm an electric utility to provide reliable, affordable, and responsible electricity. That's why we've made the pollution control investments, is to make sure we're responsible with it. And this is the best reliable, affordable option we've had. As, as we continue to look forward and talk about the marginal units, this study was released in 12. The data was looking at was getting from prior to that. They used a $36 power price, and they predicted by 2016 the price would be $39.50 or 39 and some change. We're over 43 is what a current scenario is. So the conditions are already better than what the study said. And the pressures are to continue to get better than where they're at today. The other point that I would like to make is, is that if, if the governmental entities or these interested parties who are the detractors and naysayers of CWP, especially of Dalman 31 and 32, wanted to come and write you a check for the $11.4 million it would cost to close them, it'd be a different discussion. But they're not. They're not going to come forward with any money. They're not going to come forward with any assistance. 
and they're just going to expect us to absorb it and pass it on to our constituents. Mr. Mayor. Right. You know, we're, we're stewards of the public money and the public trust, and the experts that we've already paid a bunch of money to are telling us that, and, and it was a year ago, December 2013, a year ago they said that units 31 and 32, uh, they basically advise us, you know, keep your options open, delay the decision if you can till 2016, and, uh, but currently the experts are telling us, not Frank Edwards or Eric Hobby, the experts are telling us that those two units are economically marginal. Now we shouldn't be afraid to get the most current information and to keep getting current information. None of us wants to fall in love with a power plant that's not economic. That's called spending good money after bad money. We want economically viable power plants to keep our city water and power employees hired this year, next year, ten years down the road. If we don't make wise financial decisions now, it's going to hurt and pinch everyone harder five years from now. So I think more information is wise. It's a good business practice. It's good to get a second opinion. And, um, and I, I, if this council doesn't do it, I hope the next council moves in that direction. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Dr. Turner. Um, I appreciate the importance and the significance and the value of studies, but I also appreciate the opinion of the person who is there every day, all day, who understands the power plant, understands how it works, and understand the, understands the needs of the power plant and the needs of the citizens of Springfield, and that's Eric Hobby. So when he comes in here and brings, as he does every month, a detailed report, I have to I have to give some credence to that, and I have to, uh, you know, I, I have to support what he's telling me because he is he is the expert with this, and and that is the expert that's giving us information, and I have to follow that information. On oh, average, yeah, I just um, on the, on because we're going to vote on the amended motion or the amendment for the motion. Do we have a cost associated with this? or who would be the secondary? My, my question is this. I don't have a problem with information. What I have a problem with is kind of vague. Well, um, who's going to do it? And I wouldn't have a problem with us passing this because it keeps our options open. But if you want to come back later with a finally written, who's, who would you like to see as a secondary and who, what the cost analysis would be and who would pay for it, then I think we need to have that discussion. But the way that it's put in right now, I can't vote for it. I'd like to, but we have no idea. I mean, it's kind of vague, and I understand what you're trying to do, and, and I don't have a problem with getting more information. We should do that. But until we know the financial impact of it and who would be the secondary and how we would select that and who, where it would come from, I think to put that in there puts a cumbersome burden on without a fine written motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Here no further discussion. All those in favor of the uh, amendment, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Motion fails, 3 6. Further discussion on the main motion? Yes. Again, a question for Mr. Hobby. Uh, you said that the Dalman's uh, or 31 and 32 meet all current uh, emission requirements. Do they also meet any emission requirements that are now law but kick in at some point in the future? They meet most of them, and the natural gas upgrade is the one that will put us in that position to meet those. The biggest problem we have is during startup, because we can't put the pollution controls in. Dalman 4, you can with this we'll be able to, and that will put us over in the position for those future tightening rules. Okay, and are there some uh, mercury rules that aren't in effect yet that are supposed to kick in, that will kick in? in There's certain federal days? mats in 2016, mercury rules, but the state of Illinois' current rule is tighter than the federal okay. rule, and we meet the state rule. All right, so we meet the, the future federal rule, uh, the rule that will yeah. kick in in the future. And, and again, those... That rule for Illinois is the one the Dynagy plants got extensions on from a pollution control board. So, you know, 
again, we have been good stewards, took the early on-ramp for compliance, and we worked with universities and vendors to develop the technology. Again, this didn't come free. We did this because we took the early on-ramp for compliance, and we meet the toughest mercury rule in the country. The emissions uh, that come from uh, Unit 1 and 2, uh, are they this, the same as in, from our unit, newest uh, unit, Unit 4, or? They're, um, they, they meet the state, state right, rule. Right. There, there's, there's different variables, so I don't want to quote off, off of that because there's system averages, system, you know, unit specific, so I, I don't have all the details off the top of my head, so I don't want to give misinformation. But, you know, Dalman 4 is our best performing unit. It has the most, most up-to-date and the newest. Stuff wears out. That's why we spend, you see us coming here, to spend a million dollars to change off the catalyst. You know, that happens regularly because we're upgrading stuff. Dalman Ford actually has the newest. And so it, it's going to perform the best, but, you know, we'll have to spend time, money. And we just changed out a million dollars worth of catalyst on it during the last outage. So the emissions, the emissions per kilowatt hour produced are greater from units one and two than four. Would that be? A you know, you're asking me to speculate. I don't have the numbers in front of me. I, I would rather not speculate. But and just one other thing: that this uh, 8.9 million for closure, the 8.9 million for the transmission upgrade. I didn't quite. Not sure. Understood, understood exactly the reason for it. I understand. You know, it has something to do with one and two closing, but what is the, uh, can you explain that? Yeah, the, the original CWLP system, all the, all the substations downtown, all the original ones are all built on the 69,000 volt system. That's, and then the load is fed out of those substations. All the substations built after Dalman 3 pretty much are on the 138 system. Right. Dalman 3 sets on the 138. Dalman 4 sets on the 138. Our interconnections to Ameren are on the 138 system. So what we have to do is there will no longer be any generation on the 69, so the power has to be transformed from 138 down to 69. We currently have transformers that do that, but we also have generation. You move the generation, you've got to put more transformers in, you've got to put in new bays, you've got to do multiple upgrades, and that's, that's the lowest cost option to meet the reliability standards we need to meet. Thank you. Further discussion? There no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is number 2014-413, an ordinance authorizing execution of annexation agreement with James M. DeRosa and Mary Frances DeRosa. For property located at 4238 Peoria Road, the chair will entertain a motion to recess the regular meeting of the City Council to hold a public hearing regarding agenda number 2014-413. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. aye. Motion carried. Does anyone wish to address the Council regarding this annexation agreement? Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene the regular meeting of the City Council. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. 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 Motion carries. The Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2014-413 on final passage. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded for final passage. Discussion? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 10-0. The next item on the agenda is number 2014-414, an ordinance annexing certain described real property located at 4238 Peoria Road to the City of Springfield. The Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2014-414 on final passage. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded for passage. Discussion? There no discussion. All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Voting is now open. Motion passes 9-0. The next item on the agenda is number 2014-415, an ordinance annexing certain described property located at 2501 Plateau Drive. The Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2014-415 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Voting is now open. 
Motion passes 9-0. Chair will entertain a motion to suspend the rules and place on first reading agenda number 2014-438 in ordinance amending chapter 32 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to the appointment and duties of an Inspector General. So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. aye. Motion carries. Is there any unfinished business before come before the City Council? Is there any new business to come before the City Council? Okay, no one has signed up uh, to address us this evening. The Chair will entertain a motion to recess the regular meeting of the City Council for the purpose of holding executive session pursuant to 5 ILCS 120-2C1 of the Open Meetings Act, the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body and pursuant to 5 ILCS 120-2C11 of the Open Meetings Act pertaining to litigation. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? There is no discussion. All those in favor of the motion vote aye. Those opposed vote nay. Aye. Aye. Please, aye. please vote. We need a okay. hard vote to oh, go into okay, executive sorry. session. Vote yes. The motion passes 9 0. If we go in there quickly, we probably can get out there okay. quickly. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn the executive session, reconvene the regular meeting of the city so council. Moved. Second. second. It's moved and second. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The uh, chair will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second for adjournment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries.